So can thyroid medications cause cancer? Hey, Dr. C with you. I got a question the other day that inspired this blog. Um, Jackie sent that in. Here it is. Jackie said, Hi, Dr. C. I received an email on research that said levothyroxine can cause cancer. Have you addressed this at all? Would love to hear more, Jackie. Hey, Jackie. Uh, great question. Thank you for sending that. Yes, the study you forwarded did suggest roughly a 50% increased cancer risk from thyroid medication. So, yeah. But your question is a good one, and it deserves a better answer than that. So here we go. This is a big deal. You know, just thinking about it will likely shock you. No one wants to be on thyroid meds in the first place, but how unfair would it be to feel like there's something you've got to take that might be harmful for you and you got no choice about it? Some things you might be wondering. Could thyroid medication cause cancer? Are the results of the study real? And if they are, well, how bad is that risk? Uh, who does this apply to? And then most importantly, what can you do about it? Jackie, I'm going to cover all these points really thoroughly. I'll give you details about the related studies and close up with some action steps. If you want to cut to the chase, you can jump right down to the summary if you like. Uh, the section is called, What Can You Do About It? So if you're reading the blog, you can find it there. So where am I coming from? What's, what's my agenda here? Well, I've spent 20 years managing thyroid medications. I've prescribed them for a lot of people, I've taken a lot of people off of them, and I don't really have an agenda about like pro-med or anti-med, but I do want to figure out what's true and what's going to be best for your health today and for the long term. This is a story that really hasn't come out yet, and I think it needs to be told. So let's dive on in. For starters, is, the, is it even possible that thyroid medications could cause cancer? I've read from a lot of uh, researchers and bloggers who saw this study and they dismissed it outright saying that there's just no way thyroid hormones could cause cancer. The argument is that these are things your body makes, they're the same as what your body produces them, therefore they couldn't be a problem. Well, let's step back a bit and think about hormones and cancer. You know, back in the 60s, the same argument was made for oral contraceptives and for a lot of estrogen compounds. Now we know that a lot of hormones like estrogen, insulin, they are associated with cancer. Thyroid hormones are among hormones that regulate cell growth. There's a lot of things that give rise to cancer, not all of which we know, but one of the factors of abnormal cell growth can be getting the wrong hormonal signal. So along with cell growth, thyroid hormones regulate metabolic rate and nerve conduction. And with cell growth, every part of your body is a bunch of different cells. And, you know, we live for a long time, but our cells don't. Our cells might live for days or months at the most. New ones are always dying. I'm sorry, old ones are always dying. New ones are always taking their place. So when we've got a good balance of that process, we're healthy. But if we're low in thyroid hormones, that's why we can see symptoms like hair loss or dry skin or things, because the cells aren't getting the right growth signal. So what if they get the wrong growth signal in other ways? We now know that that can be part of cancer growth. We know that exact amounts of thyroid hormones are needed to prevent cancer cells from growing. You know, too much or too little can both be a problem. What we're learning is that when someone's taking medication, the amount of hormones in their tissues might not be exactly what the body needs. You know, we know that the that TSH elevations, for a long time we've known that that can be a driver with thyroid cancer, that a high TSH can stimulate cancer cells. But there's a lot more to it than that. We now know that T3 and T4, these can be big drivers. There's data saying that high T3 equals a higher risk of developing breast cancer and that cancer being more aggressive. We know that high T4 means a higher risk for any kind of solid cancer, especially lung and breast cancer. We also know that thyroid hormones work differently in cancer cells than healthy cells. And the amount of thyroid hormone circulation is not the same as what's taking place within the body's various tissues. And on the flip side of that, if that's true, then we should know that risks are different with too little as well. And we do see that. We see that hypothyroidism is actually correlated with a lower risk of some cancers, including breast cancer and lung cancer but a higher risk of others like colorectal and hepatocellular. So thyroid hormones are not bad. They're not the enemy. Your body needs them. But like all things, this is a question of balance. And if there's too much that can raise the risk for cancer, too little can raise the risk for cancer. So it could make you think that 
This is only a problem if there's too much or too little. And within your body, that's true. But when you're taking medication, it's not the same as when your body is making it. And the core problem here is that most people taking medication don't need to be taking them. Taking something that you don't need can be a problem, even if your blood levels don't say you're getting too much. Even if your blood levels are normal. That's a big thing. That's like, I don't know, a lot to wrap your head around. So are the results of this study real? Well, Jack, you asked about one particular study, and yeah, we don't want to put too much weight on one study. There's a lot of ways in which it may not be. Uh, it's a type of study that looks back at data that's already occurred, that gives some imperfections. It was done in one geographic area. It was done over a certain population. A lot, And there's a lot of ways it might not pan out. But I do take this one seriously, because there are other studies as well. This one doesn't exist in isolation. The others have showed pretty much the same things. Um, they showed up in other parts of the world and they were pretty consistent. What I mean by that is of the many types of cancer, the other studies showed the increases were of the same types of cancer. And also there's data showing that these risks show up even if you control for other risk factors for cancer, smoking or body weight, things like that. I also think this is worth thinking about because other studies have shown that thyroid hormones can cause cancer cells to appear and become more aggressive, like I mentioned a little bit ago. And we have data on those who naturally have the wrong amount of thyroid hormone, like from hyperthyroidism. They've got the same risks for some of these same types of cancer. And then there's also a concern because we also know that thyroid medication correlates with the increased death from other causes, not just cancer, but total mortality risk. So that fits along with this. There was actually a large study from Korea that looked at the risk of death for those on thyroid medication against those who are not. Pretty big study. It was 2 million people that were monitored. And they, this one actually excluded people with cancer diagnosis. And they saw that even after taking that out, there was about a 14% higher risk of mortality for those on meds than those who were not. So how can you know stuff like this? How can you know if these risks are showing up and if they're real or not? Well, what they're doing is they're taking people on thyroid medication and comparing them against a similar group who is not. And either prospectively, meaning watching going forward, or retrospectively watching, looking at data from past, from past on these people, seeing how the cancer risks compare. And furthermore, they'll also try to identify some of the big known risks for cancers. And if we just say one group has more smokers than the other, so they would adjust the expected risks proportionally. And that gives what's called um, odds adjusted relative risks. And it's not perfect, but this is how we learned about like smoking and cancer risk. So this is still valid data. I wanna to be totally clear, not everyone on thyroid medication will be affected in these ways. Um, and also a lot of folks not on thyroid medication still of course do get cancers, but the amount that show up in those on medication is more than we would expect otherwise. These risks do seem to be real. And this is why I've encouraged people to take as little medication as possible and not to be on it if they don't need to. Let's put some context on this. So how bad is this risk? You know, risk is a tough thing. It sounds like a bad thing will happen, but it's probabilistic and our minds don't respond well to probabilities. So for starters, this is a relative risk. So it would say there's a 50% relative risk increase. Now there's relative risk and absolute risk. Absolute risk is how likely something is to happen. So if you're tossing a coin, there's a 50% absolute risk you will get heads. It's, abs it's gonna be heads or not, right? There's those two chances. But with a higher risk for cancer, it's based upon what the existing risk of cancer already is. And you're not definitely going to get it. So this is a relative risk, almost like you know, twice as likely to get struck by lightning. That'd be a 50% be increase. But it still doesn't mean that half of people get struck by lightning. And same thing for those on thyroid meds. So a 50% increased relative risk for cancer doesn't mean that half the people on thyroid medications will develop cancer. Not by any means, this is a relative risk. So it's increasing what their current risk is already. And to put that into perspective, that comes down to all the other factors about cancer risks. And it's easy to think about that and it's useful to compare against how this looks at next to risks for other cancers. 
For example, we've got good data about the most controllable factors for cancer risk factors, and that's obesity, diabetes, uh, alcohol use, and tobacco use. So I made a table that shows how these risks compare to the risk of cancer from thyroid medication. Obesity, they define that in different ways, you know, mild and more severe. It kind of wraps around the risk of medication. Diabetes, uh, between 20 to 50%. Diabetes causes tons of health problems. Most are cardiovascular, so it does raise cancer risk. That's not the main bad thing that it does. But we see where thyroid thyroid medication falls kind of in the middle of this. So not as bad as severe obesity, daily alcohol use, or tobacco use. But these things are also additive. So as we talk more about what to do about it, if someone is on medications and needs them longer term, it'd be smart to do what you can to lower any other risks. You know, reconsider the role of daily alcohol in your life if it's there. Uh, Be off tobacco if you're not already. Work to be at a healthy body weight. Those things are all super important and even more so now. Many things that control our cancer risk are things that we can't control. And genetics are large in that. They're among the biggest part of that. So yeah, when we think about it in that way, it's significant, but it stacks up in comparison against some of those other ones. And this is something to where we do what we can. There are certain things we can change and certain things that we can't. But as we go through this, you'll learn that there is more you can do. And even just reducing can make a big difference for lowering your risk. That's the important thing. So who does this risk apply to? Well, uh, good news, bad news. The, the good news is we think that it applies to most who are on thyroid medications unnecessarily. So mostly those who are on them but don't need to be on them. The bad news is that's probably most people on thyroid medication. You know, most would not fall in that category of those who need to be on them. And this is a big deal. So thyroid medications are among the top three prescribed drugs worldwide. We've got a lot of folks taking these, like huge, huge numbers. There's different degrees of hypothyroidism, and that's where the medications are prescribed. They're prescribed for hypothyroidism. The more severe forms of hypothyroidism are also called overt. That's when the gland really quits working. So T4 drops below range. That's a really big sign about that. It drops way below range. People here generally have severe symptoms, and their TSH scores are way over 20. Now, in this case, there still can be hope for diet, supplements, lifestyle changes. They can still make a big difference by themselves or along with medication, but medications can help here. They do improve health. They do lower symptoms. And this also applies to those whose thyroids were taken out or destroyed through radiation. They need medication. It's mandatory for them. The next category, though, is what's called mild or moderate hypothyroidism, and this is where most people fall. At this stage, the thyroid, it's being yelled at, it's being told to work harder than it would otherwise, but it's still working. It's still making hormone, and people can get symptoms at this stage, but their thyroid hasn't given out. It's not not even lowered its hormone output significantly. It just is being pushed harder to keep on going, and we've got a lot of data saying that at this stage, medications aren't even helpful. So it's not that they're necessary or mandatory or even useful. At this stage, it seems that most of the symptoms come from autoimmunity. They're not coming from too little thyroid. They're coming from the body's autoimmune response that we see from the thyroid antibodies. And these are things that you can do a lot with, with diet, uh, lifestyle, with supplement changes, but medications don't help the autoimmune side of it. And Most researchers now think that those who have mild and moderate hypothyroidism, they have the biggest risks for cancer from thyroid medication. And I want to say that's not definitive. That's a strong theory, but not definitive just yet. So to to be clear on that, so who is it that needs the medication? Let me get an image here. So yeah, this is going to be really those who have severe hypothyroidism. And that's those to where they've got that marked TSH elevation, you know, way above 20. They've got low levels of T4. It's dropped off. They generally have symptoms. And they had their thyroid, it's either slowed down drastically on its own, or it was taken out, or they had ablation. And in those cases, the medications are necessary, and we think the cancer risks are not as relevant for them. 
So to know where you would fit within that, it's important to know where you were before you were started on medication. Ideally, your doctor would have told you what your diagnosis was, and they might have called it, you know, below optimal or a little slow or subclinical, something along those lines, or they called it overt hypothyroidism. But there's a lot of cases in which people aren't really given a specific diagnosis like that. They're called more vague things that their thyroid's a little bit underactive, or maybe they're told that they were given medication because they had thyroid symptoms. You know, a lot of folks are put on medication to help them lose weight or to give them more energy. Some are put on that because their TSH was high normal, or maybe their T3 was low, or they had high reverse T3, they had a low basal body temperature, um, or they had certain ratios that weren't right. Some will look at T3, T4 ratios or reverse T3 to T3 ratios. And sometimes even multiple of those factors come into place. And all these things are valid. They're all things that can correlate with symptoms and can correlate with thyroid problems. However, if it's just those findings, if it's just those situations, there's no data saying the medications will solve things, that they will be helpful, but they do create the risks, that that's the drawback. And blood levels and risk. So if your blood levels are showing you're getting way too much medication, the risks are higher. The first sign of that is the TSH dipping below range, totally it's significant. But if your blood levels are normal, that doesn't mean there's zero risk. And this, this is not intuitive, but it's true. What's happening within the various parts of your body is not always perfectly reflected by your blood levels. You know, when things spill over, your blood levels will change. But before that, there's a lot of re readjustment and modification going on within your body that you keep going on behind the scenes. You keep it from affecting your blood levels, but there's still stuff going on. So that's why we see the risks don't always correlate with blood levels. Some wondered if this is because most people are on a synthetic version of thyroid medication, if that's why there was some risk. Yeah, not really. You know, the word synthetic is used in different ways. In the context, however, of thyroid medication, it just means made in a lab. It doesn't mean foreign. Really, all thyroid medications are not foreign. They're all natural. They're all the same molecules your body make. And actually, in those studies, there's always some mixture of people who are on different types of thyroid medication. Now, none of the studies to date separated people by which kind of medication they're on. So there could be a difference, but no one really expects there to be a radical difference. So, so we don't think this is different from one kind of medication to the next. So we've established that the risk is real. It applies to most people on thyroid medication and it's substantial. So let's get to the important parts now. What can you do about it? Well, if you're on thyroid medication, never take too much. Now, sometimes people are given a really high dose because they feel better on that. But please know that's not you're not feeling better because you're healthier. You're feeling better because the overdose is masking symptoms. It's hiding the real cause behind the symptoms. It's not a good thing then. The other thing to think about is don't use your T3 and T4 as the basis for your dosage. I know a lot of doctors push for this. They want to get people to the high part of the range for T3 and T4. And I get the logic behind that. And I think they mean well. But when that happens, it's almost always happening at the cost of your body getting too much. And we know that high levels further raise the risk for cancers, that it's dramatic. What else can you do? Well, cut your other risk factors. You know, don't smoke, <laughs> please. Uh, minimize alcohol. There is there is some threshold that's probably not relevant, but it's not a very high threshold. Daily intake is clearly a cancer risk, even of small amounts, even of red wine. Uh, get to a healthy body weight. Put a huge range of plant foods in your diet. Get a lot of categories of plant foods. So, you know, don't cut out massive food categories. Have legumes, have whole grains, have greens, have nuts and seeds, have cruciferous vegetables, have sulfur-containing vegetables. Do all that stuff. Fruits and berries, don't be afraid of those things. The more, the better. And then think through the idea of deprescribing. To do that, your prescriber may be able to help or they may need to pull in help from an advisor. Someone can help assist with that process. There's a section that I'll mention here in some detail about who needs medication. You know, consider that to know if you can deprescribe or not. And then think about what deprescribing looks like. 
the main thing it doesn't look like is just, you know, stopping the medicine and calling it good. It's not that. It is a process, and there's some structure behind that. There's supervision. It takes several months. And even when it's done right, you may not feel well in the process. And your blood levels can be goofy in the process. So it really does take working with someone who knows what to expect, you know, which symptoms are normal and will pass, which ones are signs saying that you got to stop and stay steady where you are. But the real goal is just to take less. And some people may need none. That's, that's a win too. But taking less by any amount is a win. I've done some other really detailed videos about that, and I'll be sure and give links to that. Now, the next portions here, I'll talk briefly about the main studies. And there's five big ones, and I'll just, give it, just touch on those briefly. If you want to go deeper in those, check out the blog. I've got the citations. I pulled some images out of the studies, and there's a little more detail about them in there. But for each one, I just wanted to pull out a few points that were distinct about it and what it really brought to the table that others did not. The first one was the one that Jackie wrote in and asked about. This was from Taiwan, and it was published in 2021. It looked at overall cancer risk. This was a pretty big study. It involved about 600,000 people on medication, thyroid meds, and it was matched against 2.4 million people who were not. So about 3 million people together were looked at. And yeah, after they looked at odds-adjusted ratios, meaning factoring other cancer risks, the number they came up with was 50%. It's kind of annoying that it was such a round exact number, but that's how it, that's how it all fell. Uh, so yeah, after all those things showed up. And they considered a lot of risk factors, not just the big ones that I mentioned before, but they looked at many other medications that can correlate with cancer risk. Uh, aspirin, statins, ACE inhibitors. They looked at prior cancer diagnosis, and actually they excluded people who'd had a diagnosis of cancer in the last three years. They also looked at some other major diagnosis that weren't cancer, but could affect cancer risk. And that included like lung disease, heart disease of various types, dementia, uh, autoimmune joint diseases, ulcers, liver disease, kidney disease, a whole lot of stuff. They made a comorbidity index which was a score of this person having early death based upon many other factors. And that was taken into account as well. So basically, any way in which the group on meds versus the group not on meds would have had radically different risks, they worked pretty well to catch that. And what they saw was that just about every cancer type was higher among those on thyroid medication. A couple really stood out, uh, brain cancer, skin cancer, breast cancer, and pancreatic cancer. Now, brain cancer had the highest risk increase. It's also a very rare type of cancer. So this is, again, a relative risk increase. But those were the, those are some of the top ones, and altogether that showed an average of that roughly 50% increased. And this was a study that looked back in time. So it was looking at things that had already occurred. And some have criticized retrospective analysis. They certainly do have weaknesses. But again, they're valid, you know, to, to degrees. So when they do show recurrent data from many studies, we have to give them some seriousness. The second study I'm going to mention briefly was from Denmark. Uh, this came out in 2013, had very similar findings. Now, this one was kind of interesting because they also looked at twins and twin pairs. And what they did, they wanted to see how much of this risk could have come from genetics. And the thought was, maybe if someone's genetically prone to thyroid disease, that those same genes could also make them prone to develop cancer. And that was actually a really fair question. So what they did was, they looked at, the, they found a lot of twin pairs in where one twin was on thyroid medication and the other twin was not. And they compared, this is really smart, they compared fraternal twins from identical twins. So fraternal twins, uh, are basically siblings, but they're not genetically identical. But identical twins are genetically identical. So if it was the case that the genes that caused thyroid disease also caused cancer, what they should have seen is that twin pairs that were identical twins, one was on thyroid disease and one was not, they should have had the same cancer risk. Whereas in a twin pair that was fraternal, there should have been a different cancer risk when one was on thyroid medication and one was not. However, what they saw was it didn't really change that, that there was actually a more pronounced risk for there being uh, overlap 
independent of whether it was identical or fraternal twins. So it basically disproved the, the, the thought that maybe genetics were giving rise to this. So yeah, the fraternal twin pairs were even more likely to see cancer develop than the identical twin pairs. So it showed that it wasn't so much that this genetic thing that caused thyroid disease also caused cancer. So it was kind of a clear way to differentiate that. Now, the third study was also from Taiwan. This came out in 2018, and it inspired the larger study. This one was focused on a smaller group of 65,000 people, still a lot, but a smaller group, and this was focused more on breast cancer. And what they saw was that there was roughly a 22% increase in breast cancer during the first year of third medication and 26% for years two and greater. So it increased the longer that they were on the medication. And just to mention, breast cancer is one that's shown up pretty consistently from all these studies and has also shown up with those who have high levels of T3 and even mild hyperthyroidism based on low TSH. Fourth study I'll mention briefly, this is from Sweden. A big one too, 2020 it was done, 250,000 people. Now, what's useful here is that Sweden has a centralized health system. So they could pull data on everyone in Sweden on thyroid medication. And what they showed was that the use of thyroid meds correlated with higher risks for pretty much every documented cancer type with a couple of exceptions. Those were testicular cancer, uh, male genital cancer, and connective tissue cancers. Now, those were also pretty rare cancers and less relevant for female populations in general. The study also showed how those risks for thyroid medication compared to other known risks. And that was similar to the chart that I shared before. It showed that it was something greater than mild obesity, not from severe, but rather similar to that from diabetes or congestive uh, pulmonary disease. The last study to mention was from Taipei. This was in 2017. This was about 3,800 people. And it showed that the medication had a more dramatic increased risk from cancer. It also showed that there was some protective effect in those who had low thyroid function against breast cancer. So we see this in different directions that breast cancer specifically is more probable with too much thyroid hormone or foreign thyroid hormone and less common with less thyroid hormone. So what do we make of all this? Well, thyroid hormones do a lot. They control our energy, our body weight, and our cell growth, our cell repair, and our stimulation of new cell growth. And that's precise. So a little too much or a little too little is a big deal and is a risk factor. Thyroid hormones from outside the body can work differently. And if we are making far too little and we need them to complement what our body's producing, that's fine. But if we're still making enough of our own, it throws things off. And we don't always see that even if blood levels are abnormal. If blood levels are abnormal, the risks are even greater. But overall, this is something that you want to be aware of and you want to know if you were given something that you really needed or not. If not, please know that this is relative risk. All you'd rather healthy things still help and still benefit you. And I've seen so much more chance for recovery than I ever would have thought. You know, have faith in the power of your body to heal. Even if you need less, that's a big win. But take the right steps through diet and lifestyle. Give your body a chance. Learn more about deep prescribing. Go deep into managing your health and take good care of yourself. All right, Dr. C with you. Hope that was helpful, Jackie. <laughs> take good care. Bye-bye.